planners looking for a new approach for the application of aero weaponry in 1952 had great difficulty in selecting the proper targets to influence enemy decision makers to accept desired terms. The FEAF staff did not know if the war was being run by leaders in Moscow, Beijing, or Pyongyang, how their minds worked, or what vulnerable items were important to them. Planners also had to deal with the inescapable fact that air power is primarily a destructive force that is perceived very differently around the world. Its application could produce a political backlash in the third world that still associated any American bombing with the devastation of Tokyo and Hiroshima. And even our UN allies were very reluctant to unleash its full fury. Okay, first BGT. After the completion of the staff study in April 52, they recommended a new targeting approach to exert what was called air pressure. The, air, the Far East Air Force decided to attack a dual use target that had previously been off limits North Korean hydroelectric dams and power complexes. Now, when General Ridgway had been in charge of the UN efforts, he had forbade these operations considering the power system is primarily a civilian target. However, his replacement, next slide please, General Mark Clark, this is Clark on the right with the James Van Fleet on the left, was even Clark was more aggressive and leaders in Washington were getting increasingly frustrated with the dragging peace talks. They all approved of this escalation in the air war, next VGT, and the power complexes were bombed in June of 1952. This is a post-strike photograph of one of the uh, one of the uh, power complexes that was taken out by American bombers. Now, the main impact of these raids was not in Moscow, Beijing, or Pyongyang, though the main impact was in London, where the parliament almost brought down Mr. Churchill's government over fears that this war was being escalated out of control. The raids also reinforced impression in the third world that Americans had no compunctions about bombing non-white peoples. Okay, next slide, please. The Far East Air Force's next turn to an assault on supply and communication centers in North Korea, basically meaning any town or village with standing buildings became a target. Aerial destruction of built-up areas reached phenomenal proportions during the war. 18 of the 22 largest North Korean cities were at least half obliterated. POWs observed that most towns were just rubble or snowy empty spaces. This is a typical example of a village outside Pyongyang. That still had not brought an armistice by 1953. So planners focused on what they considered to be the last viable target system, irrigation dams to sustain North Korean rice crop. The Far East Air Force's commander, General Otto Whalen, would not allow these attacks on such obviously civilian facilities. But as a sta his staff convinced him and Clark that holding some of the dams would wash out key rail lines to assist the interdiction campaign. UN commanders emphasized to Washington and subordinates the objective of the operation would be the interdiction of these key transportation routes, but the planners really were trying to exploit the threat to enemy food supplies. The attacks were carried out in May, and, and they're very effective. I've got two slides. Next one. These show the results of the attacks. This is the uh, Chasan Dam showing water washing out. Next one, please. This is the Toxan Dam, and uh, the B is the rail line that was washed out by breaking that dam. It uh, washed out the important rail line. Of course, it also washed out 27 miles of river valley and flooded the capital of Pyongyang. Uh, communist countermeasures such as lowering water levels and reservoirs and building backup barriers soon negated the effects of later dam attacks shortly before the armistice was concluded in July of 1953. The Air Force was quick to claim that the air pressure campaign was the decisive factor in persuading the communists to accept an armistice. However, the actual impact of air operations is unclear. There was no systematic evaluation conducted like the Strategic Economy Survey after World War II or the recent Gulf War Air Power Survey after Desert Storm. Now, in October 1999, Secretary of Defense William Cohen did present the findings of a Kosovo after action review conducted by his office, but it was not a very conclusive analysis of what air power did in Kosovo either. Now, before a more thorough study is completed, some preliminary conclusions can nonetheless be drawn about uh, air operations in Yugoslavia. I want to spend a couple minutes talking about the comparison of Yugoslavia and Korea. Again, there are high expectations for what air power, along with the newest precision guided munitions and information warfare, could accomplish. Even if many were skeptical, skeptical the primary objectives could be completed without a ground war. Next slide, please. This is a cartoon that was in the Philadelphia Inquirer celebrating the victory of air power. Now, it cannot be denied that air power was the primary offensive arm that produced a settlement without risking ground casualties. 
though the results were not those envisioned when the campaign started. It did not accomplish the most important NATO goals of either preventing or stopping ethnic cleansing, nor did it thwart the massacre of thousands of Kosovars. Sir, ground forces in Kosovo responded to the high-tech air assault with a low-tech ravaging of the whole region. Peacekeepers on the ground have found initial estimates of the degradation of Serbian forces from air attacks to be considerably uh, exaggerated, primarily due to the extensive use of decoys and deception. Next slide. These are some examples of some of the reduced figures. Initial NATO claims for tanks, for instance, were 110. When they actually went in and surveyed the damage, they found 26. Supposedly, there was just an article in Newsweek where they claimed that the actual number of tanks destroyed was six. So the numbers have dropped somewhat, as you can see from the initial estimates. Uh, Yugoslav vehicle commanders were very adept at hiding in villages, using surrounding communities as human shields. And it's pretty obvious that the air campaign is not motivated to serve to throw Milosevic out of office, out of office either. He seems, seems to be as strong as ever. Achieving any of, any of these objectives by air power alone was made even more difficult by the gradual escalation of the pace of air attacks, which reinforced the lessons learned about the drawbacks, drawbacks of that approach in Vietnam. It's interesting, some of the harshest critics of the Kosovo campaign were the same people who designed the air campaign at Desert Storm, like John Warden, who complained that this was just too slow and not massive enough an effort to accomplish the objectives quickly or effectively. Now, the full impact of problems caused by consensus building of the air campaign within the 19 member NATO coalition are only now coming to light. But it appears that targeting is micromanaged even more than Vietnam and much more than in Korea. Next slide. Exchanges highlighted the differences between American and European views of military force. NATO Commander Wesley Clark and his air commanders wanted to hit power supplies, communications facilities, and command bunkers in Belgrade on the first night. But NATO political leaders wouldn't even approve strikes on occupied barracks fearing too many dead conscripts. Then General Michael Short, Joint Forces Air Component Commander for the bombing in Kosovo, has complained extensively in the media about these restrictions. Eventually, Clark got approval for a much wider target array, but still had to get clearance to attack each objective from any nation with pilots on the mission. New information systems facilitated an amazingly sophisticated target review and development system. Basically, you had Clark in his name as uh, his targeteers hooked up to London and Washington and Germany and even lawyers in Geneva making decisions on each individual target before it was bombed. The political and legal constraints resulting from the system produced rules of engagement for pilots as strict as any war seen in history. Yet with all these controls and precision weaponry, young pilots searching for targets and forward square monitors made many mistakes. Fears of serve air defenses kept aircraft at 15,000 feet or higher and further increased difficulties of target identification contributing to the tragic attacks on tractor loads of refugees near Yakova on 14 April. The video replay of the unfortunate destruction of the Yugoslav train passing over a bridge as it was struck by a NATO missile was highlighted on newscasts around the world. And as Clark expanded his target list, the quality of his intelligence declined market. Next slide. It's a cartoon that appeared in the local paper after the bombing of the Chinese embassy, after the Chinese had just stolen our technology as well, supposedly. Outdated CIA maps led to the accidental bombing of the Chinese embassy on May 7th. Mid-level CIA analysts had actually tried to warn the target misidentification but couldn't get into the process quick enough. Uh, up to then, no one in Clark's headquarters had thought to question the accuracy of any of the information they had. Newsweek reported the mistake also resulted from a shortage of qualified photo interpreters. Same thing that happened in 1950. These errors eroded support for the air war and put considerable pressure on NATO political and military leaders to achieve results. Clark was close to running out of militarily useful and politically acceptable targets when he secured approval for the most important raid of the campaign on 24 May. The destruction of the Yugoslav power grid enabled, disabled everything from the air defense command and control system to the country's banking system. It demonstrated NATO's strength and dominance of the political leaders and civilian population. Now, knocking out the power grid also took away electricity from hospitals and water pumping stations. Military lawyers made the moral implications clear to Clark one recalled that he, we, I quote, we had preferred not to have had to take on these targets, unquote, but it was the commander's call. All major Serb cities experienced extended power disruption until they agreed to a settlement in June. Now, despite obvious differences in coalition members and munitions, there are many similarities between the air power experience in Korea and Kosovo, besides the last names of the theater commanders. Gauging the decision making process, vulnerabilities, and will of targeted leaders proved difficult. Problems with limited resources and allied, sensi allied sensibilities, a 
affected the conduct of the air campaign in both conflicts. Though there was an obvious escalation of the assault on dual use targets as the conflicts continued. Attempts at aerial interdiction of Yugoslav forces appear to have exhibited many of the same shortcomings that appeared in Korea and Vietnam. No technology has yet been developed to control the weather, and storms and clouds remain a vexing problem for air operations. Even in Kosovo, air power did get some important assistance from traditional land power and diplomacy. While the NATO ground offensive was not used, open discussions about its possibility and apparent growing willingness to gather peacekeeping forces in the region had some influence in Yugoslav leaders. The, the Korean Liberation, the Kosovo Liberation Army was also essential in drawing Serb forces out in the open where they could be attacked. And in Korea, as, and as in Korea, the Russians, despite their vocal opposition to the NATO attacks, played a key role in persuading traditional allies to accept the settlement. They also assisted NATO by not upgrading Yugoslav air defense systems. It is clear, however, that whatever sort of victory this air campaign achieved was not by clinking tanks or by causing the strategic or operational paralysis advocated by theorists who designed the air attacks in Desert Storm. Despite European attempts to restrain attacks, a less than final settlement was achieved by the same sort of imposed cost strategy applied in Korea and Vietnam, resulting in massive destruction of civilian infrastructure of Yugoslavia. Pentagon spokesmen admit that the main factor in Wojcicki's acceptance of terms was the increase in inconvenience the bombing campaign was causing in Belgrade and other Yugoslav cities. So basically, the uh, it was while even even the Belgrade media displayed these pictures of the destruction of civilian targets to try to influence public opinion, at the same time it also reinforced their own public how defenseless they were against NATO air power. Destruction is what the air power does best. It has contributed to an enormous Balkan repair bill that the president of the World Bank fears will use up any money available to deal with other humanitarian crises in Asia or Africa. Though there was no hard evidence to support their claims, airmen in Korea were convinced that escalating their attacks to endanger the rice crop forced a settlement. In Yugoslavia, it appears that the growing intensity of attacks on dual use targets in Belgrade and other cities serve the same purpose. Accordingly, there is a good probability that Yugoslav civilian casualties exceeded their military casualties. This is particularly ironic considering the expectation of bloodless war that showed up in Dewsbury Park throughout the war. A couple of examples. Here's a, uh, this is a couple of Dewsbury characters, uh, Zonker, Harris, and his young protege, watching a demonstration for the Kosovo. We want a ground war, we want a ground war. And the last thing is invade without loss of life, invade without loss of life. Very different demand. Next cartoon, this, this is a character of some of the NATO briefings. NATO's attack in a convoy west Western Christina resulted in the destruction of four APCs and a tank, which we do not regret, and one red civilian tractor, which we deeply regret. Also, it was a taxi, which we regret, and a command car, which we don't. The highway was also damaged, much to our regret, except for the access road to the garrison, for which NATO does not apologize. Jamie, there are reports of shattered flower pots. Would those be civilian flower pots? <laughs> okay, you can skip the next two. These high expectations for extremely low casualties on both sides helped convince the more reluctant coalition members to support the air campaign and increase the impact of such scenes of civilian dead and wounded. Media images and accusations of motivated UN war crimes prosecutors of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia to begin, ex they began accessing evidence in December that NATO commanders had violated the laws of war with their air attacks. Journalist Michael Nadef, next slide please. I avoid the political message here. I'm trying to point about, about, about the way technology is, in, is, uh, is portrayed. Canadian journalist Michael Nadeff has pointed out that his colleagues' accounts of the maneuvering of cruise missiles in Iraq and fascination with precision munitions have reinforced the myth that Western publics in war is now laser surgery. In the dogged pursuit of the ideal of precision bombing, the Air Force has approved its capabilities tremendously, but the term surgical airstrike remains an oxymoron. Targeting errors and technical failures will always occur, and blast effects are often unpredictable. Now, one of the most significant similarities between Korea and Kosovo is that many key decisions in employing military force were based on inflated expectations of what technology could accomplish. Next slide. I got this slide from a systems analyst at, at, uh, at the Central Command in Tampa, Florida. He basically showed me this diagram, and this is why we can't ever lose a war. Basically, if you work it out, with all the variables, you end up on the right with reduced vulnerability with our own, that's lower right corner there. It leads to reduced vulnerability for our own sources, and over here on the left side, it leads to enemy fixed, destroyed, and mobilized. 
kind of sat there and explained this to me one afternoon and said, don't you understand? And I kind of said, I said, just to get out of there, I said, yeah, I'm sure, I got it, I got it. But, uh, so that's, that's the, again, that's the technological solution to modern war. That's kind of the answer to all the slides that John was just flipping up about all these other factors of the war. Now, another factor that's come out of Korea and Kosovo is that the heaviest casualties of both conflicts are being borne by civilians. In Korea, the casualties are around 2 million civilians, much more than the military forces involved. We must be prepared to face the ethical implications of the success that NATO air power achieved because of the destruction wreaked on civilian infrastructure and resulted in non combat casualties. That does not necessarily make the application of military force wrong, but it should dispel any mistaken impressions about the true nature of the destructive force of modern military technology. It's interesting that one of the, one of the real spin offs of Kosovo is that the Russians started bombing the Chechen civilians and saying, We're just doing what the NATO did in Yugoslavia. Now, instead of demonstrating how air power and limited war will allow righteous states to restrain transgressors with a minimum of bloodshed on both sides, the recent conf conflict over Kosovo has instead shown how aggressive belligerents with the right technology can inflict massive destruction at low cost to themselves. Another lesson from Korea. And modern technological change has even brought more of a merging of the civilian and military sectors of society to an unprecedented degree, creating an even broader target spectrum that can be justified for attack. Instead of restraining war, making less likely, the power of new precision strike technology has done the exact opposite. It is now much easier to get domestic support to use force when all it requires is to launch a cruise missile or drop a precision bomb. The expectation of results will be clean and decisive when they are not. It is also much easier to escalate a conflict as impatience grows, especially when there is considerable technological mismatch between belligerents. And in a lesson that, uh, as one journalist wrote after concluding that the attacks on Yugoslav civilians were the key to ending Kosovo, he said, this may produce an, uncomfort an uncomfortable lesson for the politicians who call the shots during the next war. The most merciful way to conduct the war may be to end it swiftly and violently. There's, okay, just to, to skip through a little bit of my paper, I want to get to some questions here. There seems to be more continuity than change between the American ex experience of the air power in Korea and Kosovo. And despite the advances in new technology, warfare, the potential seems to be make warfare much worse rather than much cleaner. As William Butler Yates once warned of similarly high hopes, and what rough beast has our come round at last, slouching toward Bethlehem to be more. To conclude, I want to throw up one slide. And Looking at the air power and limited conflicts, oops, we've got a, we've got a bigger, bigger, bigger space than we've got the screen here. These are some, yeah, just, just run up the questions, John, to get to the top. These are some questions that you've got to ask, I think, before you use air power and limited conflict. And these are the questions that Jacob Smart and O.P. Whalen's group were asking in Korea in 1952, trying to figure out how to use air power there with the ground forces with restraint. Who were you trying to influence with your application of air power? What leaders, who are they? What effect do you want? What targets are vulnerable and important enough to have the desired effect? In Korea, they chose the hydroelectric dams. They chose cities. They chose the irrigation dams. In Kosovo, they eventually went to the power system. What restraints do you have? Allies are very important here, as John mentioned in his talk. How will the enemy respond? Something that is hard to foresee. The irrigation dam attacks in Korea, they didn't foresee the fact that the, the North Koreans would quickly counter those attacks by building double dams along the water. Uh, will the enemy put more defenses? Will they counter some other way? How long will it take? It goes back to John's point about democracies can't fight a seven years war. In, in Kosovo, we were almost out of time before they hit on hitting the power systems. Uh, seven, what will the backlash be? domestic, regional, and world. Again, the rest of the world sees the application of American military power very differently than we do. Even in Desert Storm, there are still Japanese journalists that compare the bombing, that compare the bombing in Iraq to the bombing of Tokyo. And eight, are there alternative means? Is there some other resource, maybe not even military power, maybe economic sanctions, that will achieve the same goal in the same amount of time? Thank you very much.